Yes, hello everybody from Switzerland actually. I, I'm not able to attend the PDEC this year in Toronto. I, I couldn't come, but I hope everything is everybody is having a good time in Toronto and uh, yeah, I hope to see you next year in Toronto. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here with you. Yeah, here you can see uh, the Rockstone Research uh, website. Uh, rockstone-research.com. Uh, I do uh, research reports on companies and you can find everything in German when you click here on the language sign German or English. You can find the research reports that I'm currently doing. As you can see here, core assets was the last one and here it goes all the way down. So you can subscribe to our newsletter here. It's free. Everybody's welcome to do that. And you can select if you want the German version of it or the English version or, or actually both versions. So I recommend everybody to, to join the list because I'm not only sending out the research reports that I'm doing, but also any news or comments on the markets or articles when, whenever companies are in the media. So whenever I see something good, I, I send it out with the newsletter. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about commerce and Seville resources. Uh, tomorrow, I'm gonna to talk about Arctic Star and Swimboard. And on Wednesday, I'm gonna speak a bit about core assets. So let's go to the last research report that I did on commerce. It was in March, late March of this year. I actually did my report number 35. So I've been covering them since uh, I believe 2013. And yeah, a lot has happened. Uh, uh, here's the latest report. And uh, actually last time uh, it was the price spike in the rare earths, which had the effect of lifting rare earth stocks, uh, devaluations of them. And that was in 2011 when the REE prices, they skyrocketed and along with it did the REE stocks like commerce resources. And today the rare earth prices are actually very close to the all time high of 2011, but many REE stocks are lacking performance. And you can see here in this report, I showed some price graphs of the rare earths. And here the blue one at the, at the bottom, you can see that uh, in late 2021, we, we were very close to the all time high of, uh, of the producer prices of rare earths in China. So we are very close. We, we are in a bull market for rare earth prices right now. And uh, yeah, REE stocks are lacking performance this time. Last times across the board, everything was rising. Commerce also had a very good performance in uh, until 2011. And uh, yeah, today everybody seems to be focused on lithium right now. I believe after that it will shift and there are like hundreds of uh, lithium stocks uh, traded globally, but there's only a handful of uh, rare earth stocks worldwide. And uh, currently we have a lithium supply deficit but actually from 2025 on, this deficit is projected to go into a surplus for lithium as more supply of lithium is coming online. And it's because lithium is not scarce at all. We have plenty of it. It just takes time to bring new sources online. And this will actually happen. New sources are coming online. It's gonna take a, a few years but uh, you know, the picture is totally different for rare earths. We are shifting uh, into a deficit this year for rare earths and until 2025, we will see uh, new incoming resources. I have a graph here, which so shows the market balance for NDPR. And currently we are here 2022 and we are shifting into this deficit this year. And incoming projects, they will keep the deficit uh, low and this will happen until, uh, two, uh, until the mid 2020s. And also this is because uh, there's a Chinese ramp up going on. And uh, yeah, until 2025, we will see new incoming projects and also Chinese of course. 
However, if China continues, so if China continues to export its REEs to the Western wo world, then everything will be fine until the mid 2020s. However, if China breaks uh, uh, the export that they're doing, then we will be in trouble immediately as the Western world is totally dependent on China for processed REEs. So more than 90% of all REEs are processed in China for the usage in magnets for EVs or uh, wind turbines. So if a crisis hits uh, us with China or there's another Corona lockdown uh, in the winter coming, or actually if the war, if, if, if a war with Taiwan and China is emerging or whatever, and China uh, is, is, is deciding not to export any REEs anymore, then we will feel the pain instantly and uh, we will even go then immediately into a deficit because we are so dependent on China for that. So, but if everything continues like right now and China behaves, everything will be fine until 2027, as you can see on this graph here. And this is when the supply deficit is expected to widen dramatically. And uh, many new mining projects will be needed to offset the supply gap. So it's a completely different picture we have here with the REEs than with uh, lithium where we will see a surplus from 2025 on. And here is also a very interesting chart from Arafura Resources. And it's saying that market analysts are forecasting a supply gap until 2030, which represents 109% of global supply today. So it's because the demand is expected to pick up uh, strongly from now on, and the automobile sector will consume almost 50% of total supply. So the supply gap is growing at a, a, a cumulative uh, annual growth rate of 8% from 2020 to 2030, and that's very big. So we are gonna double here the demand and what's required in projects. And here in blue, you can see also the Arafura Nolan project, which they own, and that this new mining project will not be enough to stop the supply crunch for rare earths. And they estimated that 11 new REE projects of the size of Nolan are required to fill the supply gap until 2030. So the question, of course, is how are we going to do that? Uh, we all know that it takes many years to bring new sources online, and we only actually have a few years left until 2027. So the supply deficit, and it's going to be felt dramatically in the upcoming years. Uh, so prices will go up, maybe a lot higher than today, but higher prices, uh, they won't do the job of reducing the demand. And that's because the rare earths, they represent just 0.05% of the total cost of an electric vehicle. So even if the REE prices will go up tenfold from this level here, it will then only make up half percent of the total costs. So EV manufacturers, they, they don't really care if REE prices are high or much higher. It doesn't really bother them because it represents just minor costs for them to produce an electric vehicle. The real concern for these manufacturers is supply. Okay, let's go back to the supply gap and uh, us needing 11 new projects of the size of Nolan. The, this Nolan rare earth project in Australia, it has uh, resources of 56 million tons at 2.6% Rio. And that's measured in indicated plus inferred. So when you compare the Nolan project with Commerce Resources and its Ashram project in Quebec, you can see how big Ashram really is. It has about 250 million tons at about 1.9% Rio. So yes, Nolan's grade is a bit higher than Commerce, 
but Ashram has almost five times as much resources right now than Nolan. Ashram is actually so big, it could be mined for more than 100 years of mine life. And this is really big. In Australia, the federal government, it's uh, actually stepping in and it's directly financing rare earth projects. And Arafura is getting 30 million Australian dollars from the government for the construction of a separation plant for Nolan. And this plant will produce about 4,400 tons of NDPR oxide annu annually. And Commerce 2002 PA, they envisioned a production of 16,850 tons are, uh, Rio annually. Okay, it's a carbonate uh, concentrate that Commerce is producing and uh, Noland is, uh, wants to produce oxide material. So it's, uh, it's a difference there, but still it's almost the four times of uh, the quantity that Commerce will produce than Nolan on a yearly basis. And Arafura has a market cap of 560 million Australian dollars, which is close to a little bit more than 500 million Canadian uh, a dollar. So Commerce resources is actually five times as big from the resource perspective and also the output, although it's a different material, it's four times higher. Uh, you can see that, uh, or let's take Hastings Technology Metals as another example. They, they also trade on the ASX in Australia, and they are developing the Yangibana project in Australia, which hosts 17 million tons at 0.95% Rio in reserves, and another, and another two, 27 million tons at uh, uh, almost the same grade. So it's a total about 44 million tons at a bit less than 1% Rio. So commerce has more than five times as much resources and almost double the grade. And in February, uh, the Australian government, they provided 140 million Australian dollar to Hastings as a project financing loan. And actually, or unfortunately, Hastings has MOUs, offtake agreements with Chinese companies. So all of the uh, product will actually go to China and not the Western world. So I believe that in the future, there's actually no way around commerce just because it's so big and uh, such a, a huge deposit, the ashram host. And somehow it's kind of normal that in the beginning uh, of new supply needed to come online, that smaller deposits are brought into production. Uh, but once they, they actually notice that it's not enough what they're bringing online, I believe that only the big projects uh, will get attention and also the big funding. Uh, here you can see commerce resources stock price in blue and also the Fun Egg Rare Earth Strategic Metals ETF. And uh, this ETF includes REE companies such as MP Materials, Linus, and many big Chinese players. So you can see that all of 2020, Commerce was performing in, in more very much in line with this uh, ETF. And when the ETF went up in late 2020, also Commerce went up. And then from April 2021 on, CCE as a Commerce was underperforming the ETF and went down. And I believe that this uh, underperformance, it's actually uh, 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 at the end right now, because you can see here in March, commerce stock went up and also the ETF went up and then the ETF also, all the stocks in there, they, they went down and had a correction and also commerce has a correction. So I believe that the, uh, um, that the correlation between those two, they are back in. And uh, so if the rare earth stocks are going up now, I believe that commerce has good potential also to, to go up from here. Okay, um, I also did a report on, uh, on Saville. It was in late November of last year, but I also looked into the market and uh, into the market of niobium. So it's still good to look at this report whenever you're looking for some information on, on the niobium market. 
And that was in November when they announced very strong drill results from their Niobium project, which is actually right next to the ashram from Commerce. So Saville optioned the property from Commerce and they drilled uh, uh, grades like 0.82% niobium over 42 meters, which is really very, very good. They even had a higher grade of 1% niobium over 17 meters. And when you look at other niobium projects globally, you can see how high grade actually 0.8% really is in comparison. Uh, here you have a chart of other uh, projects for niobium worldwide. And um, the only niob niobium mine in North America is Niobec, and they have grades of 0.4% niobium. LA from Taseco in Canada and also the Nechalacho from Avalon, they, it's also in Canada, they, they have average grades of 0.4%. Elk Creek in, uh, from Niocorp in Nebraska, United States, they have 0.6%. So you can see how good of great Saville has actually drilled with the last drill program. And yeah, there are a few uh, other exceptions with high grades, which occur in Brazil, which is Araxa and Catalao. And uh, they are the two largest producers globally. Also, there is uh, a 1.6% niobium deposit in Gab Gabun, but it's rather small, as you can see here. So there are actually only three primary niobium mines globally. Two of those are in Brazil and one is in, uh, in Canada, the Niobec mine. And Niobec actually only has a share in world supply of 7%. And this is the same uh, as uh, Catalao in Brazil. So the biggest mine is Araxa in Brazil with a 84% share in total supply. And it's a very large deposit with, with uh, very high grades between 1.5% and 2.5% niobium. But they also have the issue that only 50% approximately is recoverable. So if you do uh, rough calculations uh, with this low recovery and half the, the, the grade, then the grade looks like more than 0.7% to 1.25% at full recovery. So Seville is not too far off here with this latest drill results. And uh, both Niobec and Catalao, they are also owned, uh, they are owned by Chinese stakeholders. Niobec in Canada, it was sold for 530 million US dollars in 2014. And Catalao, it was sold uh, to China Molybdenum, Molybdenum in uh, 2016 for 1.5 billion US dollars. So both of these transactions, both of these deposits, they have about the same market share of 7% in world supply of around, but the sale price was like very far off. Uh, like uh, Catalao was 1.5 billion, three times as much as Niobec uh, two years earlier. Araxa, the biggest one is owned by CBMM. It's a private Brazilian company, but it also has Chinese, Japanese, and also Korean consortium holding minority stakes. So you can see that the Chinese are involved in 100% in, in of global niobium supply. And yeah, you know why. China is very smart in this respect. They, they, they know how important uh, a niobium is for industries. And uh, yeah, it's very important metal, uh, although nobody is really talking about it, but it's happening. There were big transactions in the past couple of years with uh, two of them. And it's a super alloy material. It's, it's critical and also a strategic material. It's very important for industries. It's very essential to many defense and also civilian applications as an alloying element in high strength and, and also stainless steel. And yeah, it's also used as a super alloy for aer aerospace and land-based power generations. As well, it's used in superconductors. So the niobium market is also witnessing a growing usage in the automotive uh, automobile industry. 
And because it's a lightweight material and uh, it's very important for designs of new cars as uh, to enhance and improve the fuel economy in, 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 in on the one hand in those internal combustion engines, but also this plays a very important role in EVs. So you can see that even for $9, 200 grams of niobium, you can reduce the, the weight of a car by 100 kilo. And which this increases the fuel efficiency by 5%. And yeah, it's also very important for, um, for electric vehicles. Actually, in 2021, CBMM, they acquired a 20% stake in a startup company, Battery Streak. And the company, uh, uh, CBMM, said back then that this strategic investment is part of uh, the new business plan of CBMM to uh, accelerate the innovation in materials for battery technology. So um, they are looking to increase this, uh, 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 this sector also into their uh, uh, business. Um, I have a very interesting chart here. You can see how, uh, how important steel is. And niobium is like an alloying element uh, used in steel to, to make it even more high strength. And you can see the steel in green here, uh, how important steel is for the solar industry, but also for, there's a lot of steel going into the winter, uh, winter power and also geothermal. So the construction industry is a very is, is actually the largest consumer of niobium across the world. And as you know, uh, President Biden, he signed a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. And so huge money is flowing into the upgrading and renewable uh, renewal of infrastructure projects in, in the United States, but also worldwide. So for that, you need a lot of steel, a lot of niobium and uh, yeah. What else can I show you? I mean, I think core assets is gonna be uh, after me. Maybe I'll show you some graphs of uh, the metals that they are looking for and they already found a great uh, deal of metals in, uh, uh, in outcrops. And here you can see the commodity index since 2020, since the last big drop of it went to 100 points, it tripled to more than 300 points already. It's a strong bull market in commodities right now we are seeing. Um, here you can see the gold price. I mean, we're, we're seeing uh, in the last couple of days a little bit of a pullback, but still here the blue line, you can see where the gold price is right now. And it's right at the previous 2011 uh, all-time high. So we're uh, testing this as a new support. And I believe as soon as we have this as a support, we are really going much, much higher because this kind of rep represents a cup and, uh, cup and handle formation. Uh, silver is lacking uh, behind a little bit to the all time high here, uh, but it's also here, it's, I, I believe it's a strong support level. Copper prices have also, uh, they're, they're in a bull market and they look very promising going forward. The zinc price also, it, it has been increasing strongly from 2000 to uh, $4,000 per ton. Recently, now we are seeing a little bit of a pullback, but I believe the bull market is really in line. And even lead, which is a component also with core assets, it's, uh, it has been trending not as bullish as the other metals, but it's performing nicely since 2000 over the last 20 years. Uh, we have a fourfold increase since then from 500 to $2,000 per ton. So it also looks kind of a triangle of formation that prices could go off here as well. So I'm very bullish actually for the commodity prices, also for precious metals. Uh, and uh, yeah, hope to see you tomorrow. For the other presentations, I will do Arctic Stein Swimboard. And on uh, Wednesday, I will do Core Assets. So thanks for joining, thanks, thanks for listening. And I give up to the to the next speaker.